Everyone wants to take their business, their skills, to the next level. Small and mid-sized business owners have exceptional insight into how to do this. They endure and thrive because they find ways to overcome the challenges that come their way, and they can teach us valuable lessons to apply to our own companies and lives. Stephen Nooner, founder and owner of Alkali, a company with a unique process that helps businesses more effectively buy and manage their insurance programs. And Bob Gibbons, builder of Riata Commercial Realty, a real estate advisor and tenant advocate, are two prominent Metroplex businessmen who, along with their weekly guests, will ask their and your probing questions, finding impactful solutions that will help you reach for the next level. Here are your hosts, Stephen Nooner and Bob Gibbons. Welcome to the Next Level, conversations that propel business. I'm your host, Stephen Nooner. And I'm Bob Gibbons, and we have yet another great guest with us today. Curtis Height is the CEO of Improving, and Improving is a uh, 10-year-old company that is technology management and consulting. They do training, coaching, consulting, application development, recruiting. They have six offices in Dallas, Houston, Calgary, College Station, Minneapolis, and Columbus, Ohio. And one thing that's cool about them is they've been seven years on the Inc. 500 list of fastest growing companies. Congratulations. Yeah, and that's only, Thank you. there's only one, I mean, there's only 147 companies in the country that are like that. So that's, that's a huge distinction. Congrats. Well, I appreciate that. I think, honestly, I think that's a, a consequence of our collective contributions as a company. Our entire employees, very engaged, and, and we're very proud of that. Well, well welcome, and we're looking forward to talking about that and that uh, see what we can all learn from from your experience. Um, one thing that Bob forgot to mention is if you want to learn more about improving, please visit improving.com. I just hadn't gotten there yet. Yeah, and we like to start with the wisdom of someone else, and Curtis, you uh, provided a great quote, and it is from Thomas Edison, visit excuse me vision without execution is hallucination, which is maybe my problem why I can't read that. What, what does that mean to you? All right. So there are a lot of people. We're, we are a very bright company, um, very educated. And in an organization like ours, that means you have a lot of really, really good ideas, more, more ideas than we can ever execute upon. And so uh, one of the things that I like to promote is it's not good enough just to bring the ideas. We have to bring the ideas of how we're actually going to bring that to fruition. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just a vision or in this case, just a hallucination. Do you have a, a way of um, filtering those ideas? Um, no, no system. Uh -huh. uh, effectively, we capture them in what we might call a backlog, and we have hundreds and hundreds of ideas that uh, we capture, and we review that backlog regularly. Mm -hmm. So we we look at the backlog, we prioritize, we look at uh, maybe along two different axes of this, looking at what brings the most value mm -hmm. and what requires the least amount of effort, and you kind of look at those two and weigh them and decide what you can do at the time. You know, I've heard the same quote from a different perspective though it's more you know if you bring me a problem don't just bring me the problem bring me a solution but it's kind of cool in yours here's an opportunity but how are we going to execute that opportunity it's kind of the flip side of the same coin absolutely very very similar dave ramsey has a cool quote um that was kind of in the same vein and dave ramsey is kind of a business guru and financial guru that um i'm a big fan of uh a mediocre plan violently executed is better than an excellent plan that never leaves the cave or stable. And I just, I thought, <laughs> there you go. Nice I'll, way of putting that. I right? like the violently executed part. <laughs> well, a mediocre plan <laughs> might need some violent execution to be successful, but <clears throat> as long as you don't use violence to get it implemented with your employees, <laughs> you're going to have to borrow that one. <laughs> All right. So uh, tell us something about yourself, Curtis, that a lot of people may not know. Uh, I have an interest in archaeology. That's something that most people don't know. I have uh, quite a bit of education in that area, and even though it is very, very far from my background in computer science, um, I still have a very, very strong interest. Do so you in like that. just digging around in the dirt? Uh, not necessarily the dirt. So um, underwater archaeology in particular, uh -huh. and uh, early in my career, I actually took some time to do hundreds of dives and worked on wrecks and recorded them. And... Uh, a uh, little known fact about Texas A&M is they have one of the world's uh, foremost programs in this area. Texas really? A&M. 
Landlocked. College Station, Texas A&M. I thought they, wow. I thought they just turned out vets. <laughs> <laughs> I'm farmers. And nautical archaeologists. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So let's get into your firm, Improving. So I know that you guys really talk about being unique. So how are you guys really different from the many other competitors that are out there? So uh, a very fragmented space. Mm -hmm. So there, there are a lot e easy to enter, um, but very difficult to get to midsize or, or above. And one of the things that I think makes us the most different is where we focus our services. First of all, we do build software systems. We consult on that, but mm -hmm. that's not where we start. Our first job every day is to build an environment of trust. And this is rooted in uh, a conference that um, I attended, a conscious business conference, and I heard a story where uh, one of the keynote speakers spoke on the perception of the IT professionals. And a very long story short, that uh, IT professionals don't have a great perception. And when uh, that really bothered me, and when I started thinking about it, it's like, how do we change that? Mm -hmm. And and we're not very trusted as partners at the executive level. So I, I tout that our very first job every day before we can do anything, it's to think about how we can build trust with any of our stakeholders, our partners, our clients, with each other, and then we can start the rest of our day. So let's put that in execution, right, to steal from your quote. So what does that look like when you're engaging a client? How do you, how do you guys build trust immediately? I mean, that's kind of tough to I mean, do. These people may not even know you yet. Uh, the first thing to do is to try to educate. So we are fans of uh, Covey's Speed of Trust books, and there are 13 behaviors ranging from talking straight mm -hmm. to showing loyalty, extending trust. Uh, but there are 13 uh, of these behaviors, and one of the practices we try to put into place is each day choose one of those behaviors. Start your day. And we have small groups we call huddles, mm -hmm. and we are implementing this more and more extensively. But uh, one of those um, behaviors might be to confront reality. Is there a situation where we're really not addressing the problem, where we're kind of... The elephant in the room? Yes, you got it. The, <laughs> the pink elephant in the room. Well, let's confront reality. And when you take a behavior, put it in front of yourself at 9 o'clock in the morning and say, okay, I'm going to do this, and then you publicly commit it to a few people, mm -hmm. a lot of these things start to happen and starts to dra drive your behaviors every single day. So just out of Curiosity for me, um, as someone, I mean, insurance industries were like were rated like second next to car salespeople, and so I felt <laughs> very, very passionate about a similar uh, about trust as well. And we operate a certain way um, to to bring that and to build that trust. One of the questions I had for you is one of the things we struggle with: What do you do when you run into a prospective client who may, after you get to really know them, right, they may not be trustworthy? How do you guys handle that? Okay, um, again, rooted into a trust behavior of mm -hmm. talking straight, uh -huh. another one of being transparent. Mm -hmm. um, at some point, you have to address it. Mm -hmm. And you have to do it while demonstrating respect, mm -hmm. yet another one. And so some of these things balance each other out, mm -hmm. but eventually you really do have to address the issues or, or they just get bigger and bigger and everybody loses. Yep. And it's much better to take a hit today that's smaller than taking a big one later, even if those customers don't want to hear it, mm -hmm. right? But all in the context of, let's say, love and respect, right? Yes, we need to talk straight, mm -hmm. but we need to speak straight in love. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and we need to demonstrate respect while we do that. So, so if you, oh, go ahead. So, so who's your ideal client? What kind of company, size, whatever? Okay, another hard one to answer. We have some clients that are a few thousand dollars when we help them develop a, a, a very small website. And we have large ones that are five to eight million dollars a year. Okay, so we help a wide range of clients. And that's another thing that makes us unique. We do value the small clients as much as we value the large ones. Now we need the large ones to sustain us on, on an everyday basis mm -hmm. um, as anybody else would. But we really, we as we have grown, we have not overlooked a lot of the smaller businesses that have helped us get to where we are. And that's, that's part awesome. of being a conscious business as well. So um, what's the biggest 
personal sacrifice you've had to make in building your business? I'm not sure if I'd call it a sacrifice, but one of the things that I did uh, very early on is shared the equity of our business. Mm -hmm. So I I don't want to call that a sacrifice, but it is something that maybe not many business uh, people will have done. Yeah, not many have. (laughs) At the very start of the business, at at, at its infancy, effectively dedicated 87% of the business for others and only kept 13%. Where the sacrifice comes in is that means I don't have full control when it comes. The the members could effectively remove me Mm -hmm. from from the company that I... So you gave them actual voting rights, not just... They have voting rights. Correct. So you know, throughout Dallas Fort Worth, when this airs, people are going to be saying, "Are you nuts? Yeah, are you crazy?" <laughs> but I also think this has the the other side to it. Is I think it's contributed to our success. Our engagement rates in um, studies, you'll see that only about thirty percent of employee bases are engaged. Mm-hmm. When you look at most studies, whether they're from Dale Carnegie or from Gallup, whatever it is, at improving the lowest engagement ratings we've received in our workplace independent surveys is 86%. And we're normally averaging somewhere between 93 and 96. Now, what does that really mean, though? <clears throat> what that translates to is is more business and more, uh, again, engagement in the company. Drive, motivation. <laughs> well, well, plus, let's say you have a large number of owners, right? They own the company name as if it their, it's their own. Mm-hmm. They um, take the health of the business as it's their own because it really is their own. And you mentioned being named onto the Inc. Uh, 500, 5,000 seven times. We're just notified eight times. Congrats. That's nice. awesome. So I'm a glass half full, so I even pain, pains me to ask this question, but what's the con of that? So what's the con of doing that? It, or, or let's put it this way. What's a challenge, right? There are challenges. And... Um, one of them is we're, we're learning in the bylaws that certain things have to happen with unanimous. And we created this. And it's like great when there's three owners and you need a unanimous decision. <laughs> yeah, two can beat up one. No problem. Right. When there's 60, there's some things that have almost been prohibitive um, as well. So that's one of the challenges. But you know what? We work through that and, and work around it when we need to. Make so how sure. does that look over time? I mean, do, do as you have turnover – uh, obviously, you have to have a mechanism for people that leave to turn in their shares. Well, how do you bring in somebody new? Another challenge. So because we have external shareholders now of employees that believe in the company but have left, mm-hmm. and they don't want to get rid of them, we don't force that. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, and we have a lot of people that have benefited. So um, uh, a few have invested and, um, and have been given an opportunity that's awesome. Hmm. I like it. Um, well, we're going to go to a break. How do you say no in a positive way? Why is it important to do so? Stick around. And now, Confessions of a Recovering Landlord. This is Bob Gibbons with Riata Commercial Realty, and I am your recovering landlord. After 20 years as a landlord, I now use that experience only for the benefit of companies that lease or buy office buildings and warehouses. Today's confession, knowledge is power. We all negotiate from a position of power and strength, or at least we want to. In any negotiation, the party with the most knowledge probably has the upper hand. And landlords count on this being the case whenever uh, you're negotiating a lease, because most landlords are professional real estate investors and they hire professional leasing agents and property managers. Landlords are in the market every day negotiating leases, while tenants probably only negotiate one, maybe two leases every few years. So tenants feel outgunned. Don't let landlords have all the power. As a former landlord for 20 years, I understand how landlords think and what motivates them. So let me put that knowledge and experience to work on your side of the negotiation. To learn more, contact me at texastenantrep.com. Again, that's texastenantrep.com. Have you started making plans to take your business to the next level in 2016? Hi, I'm Stephen Nooner, founder and CEO of Alkali. We have a trademark process called the Empowered Advantage that enables CEOs, business owners, and entrepreneurs to more effectively buy and manage their insurance. Before sitting down to make your plans for the new year, here are just a few things to consider. Would you say that you have an actual insurance strategy, one that you can articulate, Or have you just purchased a policy here and there over the years? 
If you have an insurance strategy, was it discussed under the pressure of a renewal deadline or considered earlier in the year to avoid fire drill decision making? If your answer was no to either of these questions, then you may not have the right partner on your team. Visit AlkaliServices.com to contact us and take the next step to a bigger and better future. I'm Kevin Bonfield, Managing Partner of Consenta. We work with CIOs to translate strategy into execution. And no one would enjoy a meat pie watching the Bolton Wanderers more than Stephen and Bob. <laughs> Welcome back to The Next Level. We're here with our special guest, Curtis Height, CEO of Improving. If you want to learn more about Improving, please visit Improving.com. So, Curtis, I wanted to uh, get back to some things you were talking about with your company. And I know you guys have grown. You have six offices around the country. Uh, you've done some of that through acquisition. What is the scariest risk that you've experienced in this business? I think one of our biggest risks is when we are merging with another company and, and considering the merger of another company and the culture that they have. Mm -hmm. We have to be very, very careful in our due diligence. In fact, I consider the cultural due diligence more significant than the financial due diligence, and we spend more time there. So making sure that the values align in a business like ours, if they don't, then the acquisition is... is um, in jeopardy. How do you balance? Um, I mean, because there's not, um, there are a lot of conscious capitalism type companies out there that don't even know they're co conscious capitalists, I believe. Absolutely. Um, but how do you, like, wh what types of things are you looking for when you are doing some sort of merger acquisition? What are the things, how do you, how do you pick up on those things? What are you looking for? I, I think one of the key values is dedication. And I define that maybe uniquely, but it's thinking of others a little bit more without thinking less of yourself. You need both. You mm -hmm. really do need both. So we need to find individuals that that know the importance of of developing and, and investing in themselves, but of doing that in others. And you can quickly assess that in an organization when you meet them. Have you, um, so you've done a few, um, and a lot of times, you know, statistics say 80% of the times they don't meet the initial target of whatever the goal was for the merger. Um, has this been an evolution in thought for you? Like, would you do all four again? Or is it you've evolved to know that culture is really important? So every, every single one we will do again. And in fact, we it, we could use any as the role model. We're just looking for a little bit bigger organizations now because mm -hmm. as we grow, mm -hmm. we're looking to find organizations that are are larger mm -hmm. uh, than we did in the past. But every one has been successful. In fact, a few of them we've paid off in a couple years. One we paid off in the first year, and another we paid off in a couple and a half, uh, two and a half years. So they've been quite successful. So what drives those acquisitions? Is it because there's a, you know, a, a service or something that you need, or you just need more geographic reach or what? We're looking for geographies at this point. And so we look for companies that share our values and new geographies, and we do an extensive research on the markets that really look to be growing and have very favorable conditions in them. And instead of organically going and having business development, a few consultants, it's, it's better to find a company that shares the vision and, and wants to embark in our ambition of really changing the perception of the IT profession. Hmm. So what's one of the major threats you see in your business? Uh, I, I think commoditization of some of the services we provide. Um, we're a consulting company, and sometimes that is confused with being a staffing organization, and our organization is, is much higher than that. Again, the, the fact that we lead with trust and not just providing a computer programmer or, uh, or somebody to manage a project, and you see a tremendous amount of trend, especially with um, CFOs and financial um, organizations that, that look at IT as a commodity rather than a, a way to enable. And, and quite frankly, there is no business today that is not enabled by technology. It, there, there is none. It's pervasive. And, and so we do have an objective of really getting CIOs and CTOs into the boardrooms so that they can help with the visioning and, and then in the end, the execution. So how do you shift that mindset? I mean, it, I mean, because it, it's a mindset. 
It it really is. Part of it is is getting the trust, right? And and um, another of those behaviors that I mentioned before is delivering the right results and the correct transparency. Sometimes, uh, one reason or another, I think uh, technology professionals at times have hard being a uh, hard time being direct. So it, it's talking with the C-level executives, mm-hmm. being transparent, talking about the pink elephants, practicing accountability when you're going to be late. Software is very, very hard to predict, very hard to predict. Instead of waiting till the last minute to say you're behind schedule, as soon as you notice it, you need to let the people in the organization that uh, understand the implications of that know. So a lot of communication a lot of trust building in all these areas and and i think we've been fairly successful at it we are being invited into more and more strategy sessions and getting our partners which is more important the cios and the organizations that we are helping getting them invited to the table of their chief executives Hmm. how do you uh how do you train strategic thinking i mean because that's got to be some of it too right i mean it's like i'm a technician i really love i'm passionate about it. we deal with this sometimes with some of our larger clients they'll have an hr person and the reason why they get kind of devalued is because they the the, the c-suite sees them as they just want to spend money and 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 we try to get them to think of like how can this impact with unaligned with the company's goals but that's a sometimes a thought process shift for them because they've been trained in compliance compliance you know and so i would imagine with technology just from the people i know you can get really really passionate about your technology you can want to spend a lot of money on it but is it going to deliver right and so i can see a devaluation from the c-suite perspective on on that on them so how do you train them to do that so strategic thinking and training that uh we very long answer we have a lot of execution in this area so um, just limiting it, we have programs like our Improving University, uh, Emerging Leader Program, uh, Integral Business Program. These are programs where I personally lead many of them. I spend 25% of my time training and educating, mentoring, and coaching the employees inside our organization. 25% of my time is dedicated of to Of yours, but also of your clients? Like, uh, so like the, you said getting your... CI the the CIO of your company invited into the C suite. Are you do are you providing training in that way as well or no, but we do provide consulting and coaching. So when we're on the job training, this is where we don't want to be commoditized. We sure. offer a lot of benefits uh-huh. that a, a plain programmer wouldn't or an architect or a, pro, a project manager and um, it's widely seen when we're often elevated inside the organizations that, that we partner with. That's awesome. Yeah, I noticed on your website you have a ton of different kinds of training. I was particularly taken with uh, this one. This one sounded like something that I was desperate to know what it means. Agile Scrum Immersion. <laughs> Agile Scrum Immersion. Go watch a TV show on HBO called Silicon Valley. You learn it all. You you know what that means? <laughs> yeah, I do. Do you really? We have a lot of software clients, so yes. Holy yeah. cow. But you will all right, maybe everybody much better. Knows, so. Agile is, uh, is uh, more or less a philosophy about software development with uh, several or four pillars of um, philosophy for it but scrum is an implementation of that process oh. okay so and and it's built around transparency a lot of the trust behaviors transparency continual feedback and improvement practicing accountability transparency so that class is about um that process and uh it's our most popular class actually. really yep just we, because of the name nobody knows yeah, it yeah, no it, it's rooted in lean in manufacturing okay so if you're familiar with that sure. and that's why it's a it's the equivalent for software engineering i got you we actually i saw a uh, true story i saw it on that tv show and we implemented it because we have so much going on in fourth quarter with all of our benefits clients as a way we we, we use scrum in an insurance agency huh true story we right. use it in our marketing department regularly i guess i'm the only one so where do you i mean you have a lot going <laughs> on you're making the list um where do you have to focus most to stay on track that, that we have to focus most to stay on track sorry bob's just i'm getting lots of jokes going through my head no worries all right so uh, <laughs> 
it's keeping focus is my biggest challenge. There are so many good things that we need to be doing. And, and in, right now, it's what am I going to be doing in 2017? Uh, just talked about it this morning with our um, international leadership team. And it's going to be evangelizing our guiding principles mm-hmm. throughout the organization and leading that from top to bottom. I think that I have a great passion about that. I need to develop that in, in others. Employee development, which I already told you about, which actually extends into our clients. And um, uh, in the end, uh, those are the two primary. Again, st- setting strategy, vision, things like that. But those are the two that I'll be executing on myself. So what do you have to say no to in a positive way, going back kind of to the hook? I mean, what do you have to say no to? Um, and what does no in a positive way look like? <laughs> I have to say no to myself more than anybody else because I try to take on too much. Mm-hmm. And so um, what you and when you say to others, when these ideas come mm-hmm. up, uh, it's essentially saying that is a good reinforcing the good ideas. Let's put that onto the the backlog. Let's actually prioritize this and get this discussed. So you're effectively saying yes, this is a good idea, but no, uh, the timing is wrong or something like that. So again, demonstrating respect as you're really showing the value that they're adding by bringing the ideas. You never want the ideas to stop. And so your backlog is something you guys actually do spend time on. Do you do that? Is there a rhythm to how often you guys evaluate the backlog? So they Um, don't view it as a, oh, put on the backlog, that means it's dead? (laughs) No, no. The backlog is reviewed fairly regularly. And um, we use a two by two matrix, like the value versus effort uh-huh. to decide mm-hmm. what we can do at any given time. And, and we revisit that regularly, probably at least once a month. Okay. Okay. So mm-hmm. it's, you're keeping it alive and in existence. Yes. Interesting. So um, what are three big insights that you can give us that you've learned in business? Somebody's starting out in your industry. What, what are three things you might tell them? I'm going to share in the success of your business. Really do that. I, even though i only kept 13% initially. I actually believe we are more successful because of that. And we have been able to sustain that growth for a, an extended period of time. Do you have more money in your pocket than if you'd kept 100%? I believe so. You never know, but I absolutely 100% believe so. And then another one's going to be around uh, conscious business, right? Have a purpose beyond just making profit. People want to work for that, a company that has that, and that's a great advice. And make it meaningful that people can um, own themselves in their own way. Yeah. So those are a couple. I love the own themselves. That's that's an interesting way to say that. I like that a lot. Yeah. So what's next for you? Uh, Growing this company. I'm really committed. I love the people that I'm working with and get to work with every day. And I think we can make a great impact. I believe we're going to change the perception of the IT profession. Well, it sounds like you're uh, on, well on the way to doing that. So congratulations on that. We're really excited that you've been with us today. Yeah, it's been fun first. having you on the, on the show and learning more about IT and uh, conscious capitalism and culture and all that. And scrum, Bob. And scrum. Oh, scrum. I'm going <laughs> to find ways to work that into conversation. It's a two-for day. Bob also learned what Slack was. So Slack and Scrum <laughs> in one day. Nice. I feel so fulfilled. <laughs> all right. So if you want to know more about Curtis and his company, please go to improving.com. If you want to know more about the show, please go to nextlevelshow.com. Find us on social media. Such as the Facebook. The Facebook. And we will see you guys next week with another great guest. <laughs> Have a great week. You have been listening to The Next Level, conversations that propel business with Stephen Nooner and Bob Gibbons. Join us every Tuesday at 1.30 p.m. for more prolific conversations that will take your business to the next level.